And we're back again to finish up some of the material on the airings. I've already posted a, a lecture on some of the reactivity. So when it gets to the reactivity, um, I might actually pause the video and then just draw stuff frantically in and then start recording again. So you might see stuff just appear kind of randomly uh, and very, very, very quickly. Okay. So uh, looking at our airing chemistry, what we're going to be primarily concerned about is benzene. Okay, so we've got to understand something about benzene's energy and reactivity. So what we can do is go back to alkanes. Okay, so if we look at an alkane, which is shown on our far left there, okay, fairly low in energy. We don't get a lot of reactivity out of it because all of the electrons are occupied in signal bonds. Everything's pretty relatively stable. We can increase the energy of our structure and ultimately its reactivity by pulling two hydrogens off and making an alkene. Okay, so we've made a double bond. Notice that the energy for that structure or that structure is drawn at a higher energy. If we want to increase it, we can again remove uh, two more hydrogens and add another double bond. So what we're kind of showing here is that as we add more double bonds, we expect the energy to kind of increase. Um, not quite linear, linearly, um, but it, it does increase upwards. Okay. Um, and there's a little bit of stabilization as we increase the double bonds, depending on where we put the double bonds, um, due to resonance. Black arrow is a bad idea. So what we can do is take the pi electrons and say move them. Okay, so what we end up with is uh, a new structure where we've shifted our double bond to now being in the middle and our another result of this is that we build a positive charge on one carbon and a negative charge on the other carbon. Okay? So while we have still kind of resonance and stabilization here um, it's still higher in energy, even though we have that resonance. And that's because if we look at our resonance structure, we got some charge floating in it. So a guy, I believe it was Huckle that discovered this, uh, came along and started adding more double bonds and, and noticed that it still increased. But he said, you know, sided round circles are cool, so let's go ahead and see what happens if we cyclize it, so turn it into a, a, a cyclic structure, and then maintain those double bonds. What happens to the energy? Because he figured, well, if we've got all those electrons there and we put it all in a tighter area, we'd expect the energy to jump upwards. Turns out, we saw something different. The energy actually dropped. So when we look all the way to the end, the energy for benzene is lower than the energy for an equivalent triene, or three double bonds. And he had to come up with some explanation for this. And that explanation again involved our favorite three, uh, four letter word, nine letter word, whatever it is, went through and did resonance. So he said, okay, let's move pi bond across. Now this carbon has too many bonds, so let's move this one. Now this carbon has too many bonds, let's move this one. We don't run into an issue up here because we already moved that pi bond. So the result of this is I get a new resonance structure where the double bonds appear to have shifted positions. Why would this stabilize and lower the energy? We'll go back to our linear relationship. When we looked at the resonance in our linear situation, what did we generate? We ended up with charge. Charge was inherently bad, which is why we would expect that energy to be a little bit higher. When we look at the benzene ring, yes, we're putting the electron density in a tighter spot, but in the process of doing so, the pi electrons are now shared across every single atom evenly. If we share and split up that electron density, uh, we stabilize our overall structure and we see a drop in energy. Okay? One of the abbreviations that you might see me use in this slideshow, we definitely saw it in lecture, was a benzene ring with just a circle in it. Okay? That circle is supposed to represent this aromaticity. Okay, or the electrons being shared all the way around it. Okay. Don't know why it's called aromaticity, but it is. Okay. So Huckle had to go through and say, okay, well, what if it happened with other molecules? Okay. If it happens with benzene, 
benzene can't be unique. So he went and tried to find out if there were other molecules that shared similar characteristics to benzene, okay? Being able to do this resonance without generating extra charge, okay? And what he ended up finding out was that, yes, there were structures that allowed for um, this increased stability, okay? So what we now need to uh, learn and manipulate is what is known as Huckel's Rules for aromaticity, okay? Um, the one rule that we're going to immediately eliminate here that I'm not going to test you on is this approximately planar one, okay? You do not need to worry about that rule. Um, if I'm going to show you a structure, you can assume it's, it's planar. So deal with the other three rules. So we already said benzene. So we'll go through and start working out these examples as we go through it. Benzene is aromatic, okay? So is it cyclic? Well, if we kind of blur out all the bonds, does that look like a circle? Well, yeah, so there's cyclic. Does it have a p-like orbital? Well, the like we'll ignore for the moment. We'll come back to that. So do we have p orbitals? Yeah, the hybridization of each of those carbons is sp2, which means there's an empty p, or not empty, there's a p orbital on each of those carbons. That p orbital is critical to being able to do this resonance. We need pi electrons to do resonance, remember? Okay. Last rule that we have to be concerned about is it has to have the correct number of electrons to allow for aromaticity. And what he ended up finding out was that if you had, or a structure had, 2, 6, 10, or 14 pi electrons, that it was allowed to be aromatic. Okay. There's a formula that can come out of this, and that's that 4n plus 2. So we want to look at the number of electrons in the, in the pi system. So we can go through and look at it. Well, I see three double bonds. Each double bond has four electrons, so that comes out to 12. Did I do that right? 12 electrons. Well, that's not 14. So what's going on here? It is aromatic, so how can it be aromatic? Well, does it say double bond electrons? No, it says pi electrons. So when I said double bond, I, I was confusing something. I actually started to evaluate the double bond based on it as a double bond. What we need to look at is only the pi electrons. So it's only one of those bonds. The other bond is a sigma bond. So when we look at each of those lines, each line represents two electrons. We have six pi electrons in this structure. We had the sp2 hybridization that we needed to get our p orbitals, and it is indeed cyclic, which means we have an aromatic structure. Okay. So what happens when we move to the other examples? The next one, is it cyclic? Yes. Do we have p-like orbitals on each atom? Yes. What's our pi electron count? We've got one, double, one pi bond, two pi bonds. We've got four pi electrons. Is that aromatic? Not our two, six, or ten count. Not aromatic. When we move to the next structure, is it cyclic? Yes. Do we have a p orbital on each atom? What's the hybridization of this carbon? sp3, which means no p orbital. We've hybridized as far as we can, we can't use any electrons there, which then means not aromatic. We don't even have to count how many pi electrons there are. We can't push our electron density through that carbon. Okay. We move to the next one. Do we have a p orbital? We look at that again at that carbon. It's sp2 hybridized. We do have that p orbital. So it's cyclic. We have our p orbital. How many pi electrons? four pi electrons, so not aromatic. Okay, We move to the next structure. We've been counting electrons, so the, the habit might be, oh yeah, yeah, six pi electrons, great, aromatic. Remember, all the other rules must be true. Is it cyclic? No. Not cyclic, not aromatic. I don't care how many pi electrons there are. We move to the next structure. Okay. Is it cyclic? Yes. Here's where we have to now evaluate that like thing, though. 
do we have p-like orbitals on each atom? Well, that oxygen is sp3 hybridized. Okay, so that's a bit difficult to interpret. When we looked at our carbon, we said when it was sp3 hybridized that we couldn't count anything. The problem here is that we can count the lone pair, where we can count a pair of electrons. And we can figure that out, because what we can go through and do is do yet again our favorite nine-letter word, resonance. What do we generate? When we go through and do this now, we get a lone pair on this carbon. Our oxygen becomes positively charged. To be positively charged, what do we have? We have a p orbital which means that oxygen does have a p orbital. Okay, so now what we can do is move to our pi electrons. We for sure have those pi electrons, but remember we can count now a lone pair. Why can we count the lone pair? Because we just drew a resonance structure where it was moved into it. So we get six pi electrons in this case, this does end up being aromatic. Okay, so what we're going to do with this p-like orbital is we're now going to say it has to have a p-orbital or it can be sp3 with a lone pair. That lone pair can be donated in via resonance and give us that uh, P orbital that we need on that atom to make it actually function appropriately. Okay. The very last one that we could look at, cyclic, yes, our nitrogen is sp3 hybridized, but we still have a lone pair, so we can count it. How many pi electrons? We still have one, two, three. What about our last pair of electrons? Can we count that? No, there's a couple different directions we can go with it. It's in orthogonal orbitals, meaning perpendicular. They don't overlap. Uh, the other thing that we can do to evaluate this is that we can go back. We can count lone pairs only on sp3 atoms. We won't count them on the sp2. Okay. Since that nitrogen is sp2 hybridized, we can't count that lone pair, which means we have six pi electrons and it is aromatic. Okay. If we did count that lone pair, we'd have eight electrons, and then we could say it's not aromatic. If you go to find help or watch videos on this topic uh, somewhere else, please, please, please be aware that there is a third definition. We have aromatic, not aromatic, and non-aromatic. Or sorry, not non, it's anti-aromatic. Let me try that again. Aromatic, not aromatic, and anti-aromatic. So three different definitions. Uh, if you go to get help about this topic somewhere else, almost guaranteed you're going to see that anti-aromatic show up. Okay, So watch out for that. You're only responsible for identifying if it's aromatic or if it's in that other class that's not aromatic. Okay. So next part of this uh, topic is looking a little bit at the nomenclature for our benzene reactions, uh, or sorry, for our compounds. There's a couple really common uh, larger classifications. So if we have a benzene ring with a methyl group attached, that whole piece, including the methyl, is referred to as toluene. If we look at a benzene ring with an alcohol attached, that whole thing is known as a phenol. So these common names pop up here and there. Your textbook tests you on them or asks questions about them. I'm not going to test directly anything on these. If you happen to remember the common names, great. I'll accept credit for it. But if for some reason you can't and you come up with a different name that's valid, I'll absolutely expect, accept it. For instance, for toluene, sorry. For instance, for toluene, we could say that this is a benzene ring with a methyl substituent, so we could call it methyl benzene. Perfectly valid, I'll accept that. It's not um, the common name though. The other thing that'll get tricky with these uh, is if we have a more complex structure, 
and the benzene ring is a substituent of that more complex structure, we can't name it based on benzene because the complex structure is our, our main chain. Okay? So the name we end up using instead is phenyl, not phenol, phenyl, and that's with a YL. Why do we use the YL? That's it. It's a substituent. Okay. Um, this doesn't show up quite as frequently, but for sure it shows up in several of your homework questions. Okay. Um, the next one is benzyl. Okay. All we're saying is that we have an extra carbon between the benzene ring and whatever our main chain is out here. Okay. That's known as a benzyl. So you'll see that show up every so often as well. Okay. Simple substituents, so if we have just small little groups attached to the benzene ring, um, we would name them as a group of benzene. Okay, So we come up with benzene as our main name, Okay, our main chain. Okay? As we continue through um, and we start to add on other groups beyond just ones, we run into poly substitution. It turns out that we can go through and label our, our ring based on our numbers. Chemists don't like numbers, so sometimes you'll see or you will see in a names show up with these. Okay, so our two and six positions end up being equivalent and can be known also called ortho. You might also see it abbreviated as just O. The other common one. 3 and 5 are ultimately the same as far as our chemistry. They're known as meta or M. And that 4 position all by itself is para or P. So you might see those names pop up as well. So if we go through and take a look at, say, this guy. I don't want to do that one. I'll leave you to look at those in the textbook pick one that I definitely know. We can take a look at this structure. There's a couple names we can come up with, but what I'm going to zero in on would be recognizing that we have this complex substituent known as toluene. And on that toluene, I have an iodine substituent. So I have iodotoluene. I need to be very specific with where that iodine is located. I want to pick the smallest number possible, so I could call this 3 iodotoluene. I can also refer to position 3 as meta. So I could call it meta iodotoluene. Or if I'm really lazy, I can call it myoto. Actually, you wouldn't call it that. You'd call it M uh, iodotoluene. Okay? So we just add up, end up coming up with different names referring ultimately to the same thing. I'm not sure exactly why we came up with names as opposed to using numbers, but that's what we've got. That's what we're working with. We just have to deal with it. Okay. Um, oops. As far as speeding the reaction goes, I think I've already got this built into uh, lectures already posted, so I'm going to swing through this pretty darn fast, or at least what I would say is pretty darn fast. Uh, as far as deciding, answering this, if we want to speed up our reaction, what we're going to want to go through and do is um, make our electrophile more electrophilic. So when we do our EAS reactions, I skipped a slide. Yeah, I did. Um, sorry about that. So when we run uh, reactions with our benzene rings, they are more stable, but they are still reactive. Uh, we end up seeing a new mechanism. The electrophilic, so an electrophile, aromatic, so we've got our benzene ring, and substitution, we're going to do a substitution for... Um, uh, our hydrogen for the electrophile. Okay. So if we look at our overall reaction, uh, our electrophile we've already established is positive. Our benzene ring will have to act as the nucleophile, which means it is negatively 
charge or we're trying to get negative charge on it. So if I want to make this reaction go faster, I can either make the electrophile more positive or the nucleophile more negative. For a complete mechanism, because I'm not going to show one here because I've drawn it a couple times, uh, there is a, a lecture video. I'll try and make reference to it in the footnote so that you know where to find it um, that goes through the mechanistic details and I think goes through the rest of this chemistry a little bit slower. Okay. So now we'll push on through the rest of this. We can look at our electrophile and making it more electrophilic. This is ultimately bringing in catalyst to kind of speed the reaction. If we go through and rank these, or let's not even rank these because I know that's happened in the other slide. How can we make it more electrophilic? And our last one, we can add something as a Lewis acid catalyst. The Lewis acid catalyst, aluminum has an empty p orbital. The electrons on our chlorine can share across. And we end up making this carbon exceedingly positive. That positive is now my electrophile. If we started with bromine, okay, we want to make the bromine positive, and in this case they're both neutral. What we can do is add another Lewis acid catalyst, in this case iron tribromide, and we can take the electrons across, share them with the bromine, or sorry, with the iron, and that makes one of our bromines extremely positive. There's our electrophile there. Okay. So when we're trying to speed up the reaction with our electrophiles, we're usually adding something like a Lewis acid um, to try and shift the electron density away from one atom or another to generate better nucleophiles, or sorry, electrophiles. Okay. And that's where we see all of the different types of electrophiles that we can run in our reactions. Okay. Um, so what you would need to be looking for is when you see a benzene ring, you would need to look at what things are attached to it. So if you just saw a bunch of carbons attached to it, the thing that would match that would be the R+. How can I get an R+, generated? Well, work your way backwards to get R+. I can take aluminum trichloride and Rx, okay, where X is any halogen. If we're adding aluminum trichloride, good halogen to add would be chloride, okay? So look for the pieces attached. If on the ring we have a chlorine, how do I generate a positive chlorine to react with it? Go backwards. What reactant do we need to add? In that case, we're adding Cl2 and iron trichloride. So it's trying to play kind of a matching game of what pieces need to add, what things actually work. For your cheat sheets, I would recommend writing down probably the reagent so this, and then I would give just the reaction arrow straight across to Cl+. The rest of those intermediates, while important to understanding the chemistry of what's actually occurring here, aren't going to help you as far as predicting reactions go. And if you need to be able to predict what reagents to use and all of that, that's exactly what you're going to need. Cl2, iron uh, trichloride give you that Cl plus that you need to act as the electrophile. Okay. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, when the two aluminum chloride reagents uh, were named after Friedel and Crafts. I believe it was actually two people. Um, it's just a famous reaction, so it's named after them. Okay, so these are known as the Friedel Crafts alkylation and acylation. Alkylation, because if we just add carbons, all we're doing is adding an alkyl group. The acylation is known as an acylation because what we end up adding is this group. And we can have as many carbons out there as, want, as we want. And that's known as an acyl reaction. Okay? So you'll see it in your textbook as a Friedel Crafts alkylation or Friedel Crafts acylation. They're ultimately referring to the same kind of mechanism for these reactions. Um, last two electrophiles that you should be including and work with a little bit um, would be nitric acid and sulfuric acid reacting to form nitronium ion. This is one of my favorite reactions because how does nitric acid react? 
what does it end up doing? It acts as a base in this reaction. Nitric acid being a concentrated, um, super strong acid, somehow is forced to act as a base. So it's just kind of neat that we can force what we would typically classify as a strong acid to act as a base. So just kind of fun. At least what I consider fun. Last one is a bit interesting. Um, if we start with an alkene, we can make, turn that alkene into an electrophile by reacting it with a strong acid. So activating it with the acid as we did in our addition reactions, except this time we don't add another nucleophile. Okay? If we avoid the presence of that nucleophile, then the benzene ring can act as the nucleophile and actually uh, do the substitution reaction. Okay. So it's just kind of neat in that case. There's multiple ways we can generate positives uh, or carbocations, those positive charges, to react. Okay. So that's ultimately all we're trying to do is make our electrophiles positive. As soon as we got that positive, we can now throw in our benzene rings and we can get those uh, substitution reactions to occur. Last thing that we could evaluate is trying to speed the reaction um, by looking at the nucleophile. Okay. Our zero point in this case is comparing back to hydrogen um, because that's ultimately if we didn't have anything on there we'd have to put a hydrogen. Okay. So in this case I'm putting in a different group. In this case atom X has more electrons. Okay, so we're just going to summarize this. X has more electrons than hydrogen that means we can donate electrons into the ring and we can put negative charge on the ring. Okay, well, if we want our aromatic ring to act as a nucleophile, what charge should be on the ring? It should be negative, okay? Which means that if atom X has more electrons than hydrogen, it acts as an activator and our reaction goes faster. We can then also evaluate where our substitution is gonna direct Okay. All of those hydro or those now five hydrogens have different reactivities because they're different environments. They see different things around them, which means atom X is now going to direct and force the chemistry to occur only at certain positions. What we talked about in class is that it directs to the para ortho positions. One of the other things that I mentioned in class, you're going to be responsible for the para reaction. Do not need to worry about the ortho uh, as far as predicting products go. And that's just because the para is more likely to occur because the ortho is sterically hindered. Okay, So it's just less likely for that position to react due to the steric hindrance about that position. Okay. Um, I would highly recommend that you go through and draw the resonance structures that uh, would be generated by this electron donating group into the ring. Okay? You should be able to draw three of them. These three resonance structures, while not officially uh, part of any mechanism, are helpful for you to be able to predict where this reaction is going to occur. Okay? Next part of this is what happens if we go through and switch it up, and instead of atom X having more electrons than a hydrogen atom, it has less electrons. To get less electrons than a hydrogen, what do we have to do? What we need to do is make it positive. Okay. This can be a formal positive charge, as we see here, or it can be, much more sneakily, a partial positive. How would you find out if it was partially positive? It's a good call. We would look at resonance. So you could either look at the resonance, sometimes you can see it by evaluating what things are attached to that atom. Are they electronegative? If they're electronegative, it's going to take electrons away from atom X, give us that partial positive. Okay. If this is indeed the case, again, you should draw your resonance. Our ring can share electrons out to help stabilize that partially positive uh, X atom, which then builds positive charge on the ring. We want our ring to act as a nucleophile, which means it needs to be negative. 
If we make it positive, we've now deactivated the ring. We've slowed it down. So we could refer to X as a deactivator. If we force the reaction to occur, or we give it more time or heat, uh, atom X is still going to have an effect on the substitution reaction, on which hydrogen is favored to substitute. And that's where we get our deactivators being meta-directors. So if we have a deactivated ring, we would expect it to substitute at the meta-position. Okay. Hopefully you had reasonable notes when we talked about it the first time. If not, what I'm going to recommend, because I'm pretty sure the next slide, um, yeah, we're pretty much at the end. So if you don't have great notes on the mechanism of the overall reaction, because I didn't actually show that in this recording, it can be found in the other recordings that I've posted, um, hopefully tonight as well. Okay. Um, that people asked about during the, uh, the study session on Friday. So please take a look at those. Make sure you understand the mechanism. This mechanism, I promise you, is going to show up on the exam. Okay, So make sure you understand it thoroughly because I think it's an interesting reaction. It involves lots of resonance. One of the more important topics this semester is that resonance. Um, so please watch out for that it will show up on the exam. Okay. If you've got questions, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email and I'll see what I can do to get back to you. I'm going to be out of town for a little bit. Um, so I should be responding by Sunday, hopefully. Okay. Uh, if I don't hear from you, good luck on the exam on Monday. I'm sure you'll do great.